on you. my property. You didn't win shit in my yard. Wait, wait, wait. I, all of you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Three, two, one. All right, we got Billy Coles here from the Smith Mountain Lake Guiding Services. Um, you have a really cool story that we're going to get into today, guys. We're going to get into Smith Mountain Lake fishing too as well. But first off, you and we were talking before the show started here. You went from Minnesota down here and then to a wedding planner. So I want to really track back. Why would you, how did you come from Minnesota to the, the, the destination for all the rich of DC Smith mountain sure. Lake area? Like, how did that work? Sure. There's uh there's a lot more in between that. So um, I have been gone from Minnesota almost 13 years. So when people ask me like where my home is, my home is in Virginia at this point. Um, my dad asked me sometimes, he's always like, Hey, would you ever move back to Minnesota? I don't think I'll ever move back to Minnesota. Um, go visit in like June, July when the, when the weather's super nice and stuff like that. But basically I was a young mid young twenties essentially. And my first job was teaching snowboarding lessons. I broke my arm and two ribs. Uh, I wasn't super into ice fishing. And I was like, you know what, this is stupid. I like bass fishing. I'm going to move to the South. Um, so at that point I had worked for Wells Fargo, um, just like an entry level type job, worked my way up to kind of like middle management type stuff. And they bought Wachovia and that pushed me from Minnesota to Winston Salem, North Carolina, huh. um, which was super nice. Definitely culture shock as a, as a 22, 23 year old, yeah. um, just completely moving away. I did not know a single person, um, but I pulled a bass tracker that I just beat the hell out of on the Mississippi river down. Um, when I got here, I sold it for more than I bought it for two years earlier, because everyone loves bass trackers down here for some reason. Nice. Um, and then I bought a ranger, jumped into a bass tournament two weeks after I moved here, a Fishers of Men on Blues Creek. Uh, that's when I really got the tournament bug and I took second out of 53 boats. Um, and I thought I was, honestly, I thought I was a hot shot. I was gonna come bring my Minnesota techniques and kind of beat up on everybody. And the rest of the year, I just got stomped on. Um, so that kind of got me on my, on my fishing journey. And then through fishing is actually how I got into, to weddings. So I actually do photography and videography, um, a little bit of the planning stuff too, as far as like timelines and running the day and everything like that. But fishing, um, got me into the photography side for product photography. Um, if anybody knows the name, Josh Douglas, he just made the elites last year, mm -hmm. but I've known him for a long time from Minnesota. Um, he grew up not super far from me. I didn't know him at that time, but I reached out to him when I lived in um, North Carolina and he lived in Chattanooga and talked to him about shooting some product photography and stuff um, for him. And he was sponsored by a Japanese company called Biovex um, for a lot of years when he was doing the open stuff. So I hooked up with Biovex and started doing like catalog shots and lifestyle photography. They make um, a lot of like shore fishing bags. Huh. Um, I don't know if anybody pays attention to the Japanese shore fishing, uh, <laughs> information, but like, I guess it's really hard to get a boat, um, and fish like actually on a boat in Japan. And so everyone fishes from the bank. So there's like bio three lakes, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And I've seen pictures, dude. It's like, it's terrifying. I would not want to want to try to fish there. Like everyone's on the bank. Dude, it's insane though. Like that's why, you know, the drop, that's, that's how the drop shot became a thing. It's like, oh, we yeah. don't. When people over here bitch on social media about burning spots, look at those guys and what they oh, yeah. have to go through. It's yeah. insane. South Korea, J China, Japan, like there's 2,000 people on the bank at, at like fishing opener or whatever. And there's a lot of restrictions in the pan too. So, so Biovex had this company uh, that they partnered with that, that did uh, like high end tackle, like fanny packs and backpacks and stuff. I honestly probably still have like 10 of the bags from like 10 years ago. Um, but that's what got me into photography was working with Josh. And honestly, I kind of missed the the swing. And I'm not going to say I was like an OG, but before like Brandon Polinick and and all these other guys did all this YouTube stuff, Josh and I were playing with the idea of like series or like TV, sh like YouTube shows. Um, and I just never like had the balls to quit my job and just go do it because there wasn't a lot of money in it in the in the in the kind of beginning parts of it. But definitely like that's where Josh 
is definitely going to go, I think, is is running in that direction. I know for a long time he said he wanted to have a show on, like, Minnesota, you know, outdoor channel and stuff like that. So, um, so that got me into photography. And through that, I actually had a friend in Minnesota dare me to do a wedding and say that I would miss the first kiss and ruin these people's lives. Um, so... I took that as a challenge and I'm a kind of go-getter personality type. So I shot a wedding for an employee of mine at Wells Fargo for free. Um, booked, I, I made the wedding, uh, photography stuff. And then I actually did a video for it too. And I signed up for a wedding expo. So similar to like ICAST, they have wedding expos all over the country um, all the time just to meet vendors and everything like that. And I booked six weddings at my first wedding show that covered like 90% of my Wells Fargo salary. Wow. So um, yeah. that, yeah, so that gave me a, a big red flag of light or like a green, green light, I guess, of, okay, I can work and get two weeks of PTO, or I can set this thing up to where I can at least replace my, which middle management, I wasn't making a super ton of money, but um, enough to where I kind of built this in my head and plan of if I can work on the weekends, make just as much as I work at Wells, can I fish during the week? Can I guide? Can I like supplement income with something else? Um, and honestly, that was almost 12 years ago. Um, few girlfriends mixed in between, moved to Maryland for a little bit. And then I met my wife in the Outer Banks. Um, and I had been fishing kind of intermittently throughout that with tournaments, fishing with men, ABAs. I fished some bass opens as a co-angler and, and did pretty decent for a couple years. Um, got into kayak fishing pretty heavy and uh, met my wife in D.C. We kind of lived there for a little bit. Um, and then we chose Roanoke, um, Southwest Virginia mountains, Blue Ridge, after we did a big long trip with a fifth wheel RV to Wyoming and Montana. Um, so if I wasn't here, guiding for bass we almost moved to montana i would probably be a fly fishing guide um in montana or, or wyoming or idaho which some at some point in life probably will be out in that area hopefully um maybe for a little bit so i'd, I'd like to do that as a as a different path or, or different you know i'd love to do down here when it's awesome and like you kind of like the big swim bait stuff and i'm here in the winter when it's when it's big girl season and then get out of here when it's super hot and go be a fly fishing guide or something in the, in the West would be, would be phenomenal. But I had fished on and off uh, Smith mountain for about 10 years, just random trips. One of my best friends uh, grew up on this lake. His dad actually lives like five minutes from us, which is super weird. Um, out of all the places we could have lived, I lived like five minutes from where he, he kind of grew up. So I had seen the potential of the lake and Smith mountain reminds me a lot of, kind of the, some of the lakes I liked in North Carolina, like Blues Creek um, a lot. And um, this is just an awesome lake. If you want to be a river rat, you can hang up in the rivers. When it gets dirty water, you can go check spinnerbait, like do very like textbook river rat stuff, which is what I did in Minnesota when I was um, in college. Or I can go throw a seven pound line for big small mouth in the natural rock stuff that reminds me of like home, like Minnesota and Canada. and and kind of the, the Northern Lake. So that's kind of how that all started. And then when we moved here, it was honestly two weeks before COVID. I already knew that I kind of wanted to, to do the guiding thing and all of our weddings rescheduled for like six months. So I was able to literally get on the water for like six months straight. And I think a big part of the the success of, of me specifically as a guide, but also on the tournament scene here is Dude, I was just blessed and lucked out where everyone else was still having to go to work. I didn't have to go to work for four months. And I literally would just grab a cup of coffee and I would go graph for eight hours. Mm -hmm. um, so I've covered this lake twice, top to bottom. I have like, I'm not exaggerating and I know it's overkill, but like between 3,000 and 4,000 waypoints out here. Like I, I fish with guys that are like from here, gener like generations. And they're like, hey, like, let's go hit this area. There's a little like stump field or rock pile here or whatever. And I'll look down on the graph and they're like, they just get annoyed. Or like, we all just laugh about it because these guys have been fishing here for 25 years. And I feel like I swooped in and just put in the time with with graphing and, and electronics. And I'm a big electronics guy. I'm like not fishing and spending the time to kind of see how fish are set up and and kind of understanding that side of it, um, which helps with the guiding. But basically, I 
hunkered down, passed the captain's test, and uh, and launched the business. And then, like I told you before we before we started, it it took off. There's not very many bass guides out here. It's mostly striper guys. The lakes, in my opinion, has a huge population of bass and has a huge population of big bass. Um, and just like you said, Thomas, I mean, most of the clients that I'm taking out are, are DC. You know, they're Northern mm -hmm. Virginia. It's a family of four. The son plays soccer and video games. He's never caught a fish in his life. If he can catch a three pounder, I literally am watching his brain melt. Um, like it's awesome. It's, it's super, yeah. super fulfilling to see a dad and a son, like experience something like that. And I've had awesome repeat clients come back. I have a few clients that are new to fishing, but competitive and, and kind of coming from a different sport or a different, like, you know, college or whatever that, that have no idea how to fish at all and come out multiple times with me where we kind of break down the lake, break down electronics and, and everything like that. So um that is all going great and then on on me personally we do the weddings we do about 40 to 50 weddings a year as a company so it's holy it's, shit yeah it's pretty substantial how um, many years from from what what year are you in with that is this like year six 12, seven no, 12? 12 yeah wow yep. so i just doing full, your wife or is it multiple uh, no, employees we have, yep we have subcontractors okay. um some contractors, we did 72 last year, bro, because of COVID reschedule. So, Damn. yeah, it's it's Holy a lot. Um, I've definitely been doing I I would say on the wedding side, super quick, I'm a straight-up veteran, dude. People don't last that long in weddings. It's it's pretty hard work. It's stress. Really? Yeah, it's stress. It's, you know, I'm only 36, dude. My ankle's bad. My knees are, like, it's a lot of gear carrying and, you know, from, from video side and the creative field is interesting too. I know a lot of people think like, oh, I sit behind a computer and you just edit the brain power to <laughs> make like, yeah, the, bra the brain power to make like wedding films and content and, yeah. and sit down and edit and find music. I mean, dude, it, it will, fr it'll cook your brain when I'm done editing after a 14 hour edit day, I am no use to anyone. It, yeah. Um, it'll kill your soul. <laughs> it, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it's definitely hard on the mind. Um, but we do the wedding stuff. We're, we're kind of, going to slow it down next year. Um, we'll probably only end up doing about 25. Guiding is going to, you know, take care of a, a good portion. My wife runs a clothing boutique. We run an Airbnb in our basement. And then I'm actually um, picking up my real estate license here in a, in a month or so just to dabble in that a little bit at the lake since I, since I make a lot of connections through fishing. So dude, we're, we're all over the map. Maybe, maybe trying for a kid next year. So we got we got a lot going on over here. Dear God, man, this has been brought to yeah. you by Adderall and Red Bull. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I don't sleep very much. <laughs> I don't feel thirty six uh, in my mind at all. So so we'll see how that goes. But uh, dude, I'm blessed, man. I get to fish, and you and me talked on the phone, dude. I mean, if I really really want to, I could go out there five days a week if I wanted and, and edit at night and, and do that. So that goes way back to what I first started on when I booked those six weddings. That has honestly been my plan for 10 years has been, I want to create a business and a few different streams of income to where if I want to go fish a tournament or if mm -hmm. I want to fish during the week for myself on a Tuesday, just to get away from everybody and clear my head, then I have done that. And for anybody that wants to do that, it takes some time <laughs> and some sacrifice for sure. But um, you know, I've probably only had that opportunity for the last for the last two years after working on it for ten. So, well, co co you also like right place, right time. Things happen for oh, a reason. hundred million percent universe, dude. I I don't know that we we did not experience like COVID like everyone else. I mean, Smith Mountain's definitely out here, um, and we you know we we lived in Reston, um, in DC for a long time or not a long time but long enough to where. You know, we were driving to D.C. and get stuck and doing three hours of traffic driving to D.C. to do a wedding. And we, we just decided we said we could live somewhere else and drive three hours in the night before um, and just have a completely different life. And that that was kind of what what made us move was, you know, if we have to commute up and shoot a wedding 25 times, 30 times a year in D.C., that's 30 days of commuting. But we'll be able to be at the lake Monday through Friday and go on a boat if we want to or paddleboard or walk, walk the state park or anything like that. But COVID they yeah they closed some restaurants down here and stuff like that but the lake is wide open it's so crazy when when i started this channel people said like why are you covering such a big area and, and what i had to tell people is when i fish college tournaments and i got to go all over the place 
we are the most transient division of 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 anglers on the planet and and yep. when i would go down to like the national championships in alabama and they would be like so we travel maybe 20 minutes for most of our tournaments i'm like dude that is so lucky because we, where we're located, dude, it's four to five hours. Like we're yep. used to driving. And when yep. you say you have clientele from DC driving to Smith and, and for you guys that, that don't know, yeah, that's down 81. That's about four, yeah, three to yeah. four hours, deep Creek, Kerr, the title Potomac, the James, like people around here, whether you're an avid angler or a hunter or you vacation, this area is used to commuting. And so that's, I think that helps in one sense for your clientele base to come down and you get a lot of that, um, I guess that outside traffic. I, I, the one thing that you, you hit on though, which is interesting is that a lot of it is that DC, that DC traffic coming down, but you don't get the people like, and you, you mentioned Josh Douglas, he has people that fly in on a blindfold so he can take them out on Lake Mille Lacs yeah, because it's sure. a premier destination and you get those type of anglers. Are you getting those type of anglers for Smith? Those savvy ones are like, get me on a pig or is yeah. that coming or? Yeah, I think that's definitely coming. So how I would break out my guiding is I would probably say six out of 10 trips are new to fishing fish once or twice a year. A two pounder is a big deal. A four pounder, four pounder is life changing. I would say the next two are like avid anglers they can throw a bait caster if we catch 15 pounds they're like awesome you taught me a bunch of stuff i'm working with them on like cadence weights on like different fall rates colors bait transition bass transition all that sort of stuff and then i would say probably the last two are like hey i will come to you early or late february and we can throw a 10 inch bag grab. if i don't get a bite i don't care mm -hmm. but try to put me on at eight so I would say, I, I don't know that I would envision Smith Mountain being a Mille Lac. Like, hey, come out here and like, for example, Josh, I've talked, uh, you know, again, I could, I could call Josh. Ooh, pick up, lost you. You there? You there? You there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Lost you around. We've lost you around minute 17. So uh it was uh you're talking about Malax and Smith Mountain Lake. Okay. Did the you hear the like one out of ten or like out of ten guide clients? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Okay. Okay. Um no, that because that was that's interesting because I I didn't think like I don't know I do I think Smith could ever be like Malax like no because that's like going to Mexico like I mean yeah. like for some giants but to get savvy anglers to come there and I think it it's a telltale sign when you you look at other bodies of water we and we mentioned to this I think before the show started that um you know Kerr you know gets a lot of a lot of spotlight from different tournament trails throughout the year and yet your clientele is primarily generally speaking, just your, your person that dabbles in it. And so it shows yep. you the, like the whole, the United States, you know, bass fishermen really don't know about Smith because you're not getting those savvy ones that want to come to you to hunt, which is interesting. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I would say if we see some 10 pounders coming out regularly, I could see it being, I could see it being something where people are saying, okay, like, you know, if we have, let's say next spring, just m miraculously, we have three 10 pounders come out and it blows up on social media. Then I could see me getting some calls on it. But I think the problem on a comparison to Mille Lacs is I think when I talked to Josh about guiding a little bit, I think last year he had every guide trip was over 20 pounds except for one bag. And it was like 18 something. Like, dude, for as good as I feel like I can guide and put a true angler on a good bag, I can't do 20 pounds four days a week out here. Like too, too many can just conditions change and, and there's too much area and there's, there's, they're definitely, and we, sh we should talk about this a little bit. I'd love to get your thoughts on it because I keep journals and, and fishing notes, but the F1s are, in my opinion, pretty finicky when it comes to like, I think I'm starting to see a pattern of, of different weather and different temperatures and stuff like that to where I think a little bit of their kind of like Florida attitude is definitely coming through on the DNA. Um, so I don't know if Smith would ever be a destination besides February and March, as far as, Hey, I want to come down there and try to catch a giant one. 
um, on a swim bait or a glide bait or an A rig or something like that. And then the problem with that is what I what I mentioned earlier about Tennessee. I mean, it's pretty hard to leave the Tennessee River in early March when you can go catch a 25 pound bag. Mm-hmm. Like, why would you drive to Smith and do it? If anything, if I was an angler and it was August and I could go catch 14 pounds on on Chickamauga and that's all I could do in Gunnersville is not fishing great. That's where I'd be like, yeah, I want to go to a deep Highland Reservoir and throw a shaky head or a Carolina rig and Smith mountain puts out 22 to 25 pound bags. I think so. We, uh, we interviewed guys and this, this, this episode's probably already dropped by the time this one gets going. Um, we interviewed woods and water magazine and they think in a couple of years, you're going to see some dirty thirties dropped at Lake Anna because of all the, uh, F ones that have been stocked in there. The last, it wasn't there like a 26, 27 in the spring. Yeah, there was. And so then that's before the F ones, are, are mm-hmm. even big enough right now. I think they they actually caught some Odenkirk who runs that area of the DNR, and I need to get the DNR on at your area too. But he he cracked some of their um he he cracked them open because what they do is they actually they dye their inner lobes to see if they're stockfish, and he said in two and a half years they're already fifteen inches long. Yep. Um. So they're they're not even there yet. So the fact yeah. is that they're catching twenty five pounds, and, and so a dirty thirty is possible. And, and the reason I say that is, and we talked about the F ones. I think an aggressive F1 stocking program is how you get a dirty 30 at Smith. And then that is what's going to change people's look about that lake. I have not seen a 30 yet, um, but I had a 27, 10 day with a three pounder dude. Wow. So uh, it's definitely possible. Um, I don't know if you know the name Chad Smith, but he was, he was with me just kind of stopped in, in between opens. And I mean, we went on, we went out on just a, just super shitty day. It's pulling like 25 miles an hour. It's freezing, like whatever. But I mean, yeah, we had 27, 10 and a three pounder and we had two bites that came off. I mean, I, I definitely think we were, we were right there, but that's, that's the closest I've been for as often as I fish out here. But I do think a 30 is possible. What we need here is we need dirty water in the, in the, the fall and spring. Really? If we, Why? Yeah. If, if we can get that, I think it's just water clarity, water clarity stuff. I mean, last fall for the, for the cat trail, um, which is, which is a trail that I fish have fished every year, spring and fall, since we've been here, if the water's clear, you definitely can see, and I can see on my journals and stuff like that going back. If we have 10 foot water clarity in the fall, it's, it's pretty tough to get them to, to eat okay. as well. Gotcha. Wow. That's what you meant. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, cause there's some California lakes that produce 10 pounders. I, I get what you're saying. Oh, it's sure. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm just saying, yeah, I'm saying to make it be pop, like much easier to catch a dirty 30. Um, you know, I, I for as, as bad as hurricanes are and loss of life and, and mega damage, dude, if, if we get hurricane <laughs> residue, I'm all about it, dude. I'm honestly, I was a little sad cause I had a wedding in New York when the, when the big bass was here, I can't fish it anyways, but I was watching the weather the whole time. I wanted it. I wanted it to dump like five, six inches of rain, and it barely even rained here. Um, a wedding in New York. What is your range for weddings? Good lord. <laughs> I mean, dude, we've done Mexico a few times, um, California. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's it's uh, it's pretty crazy. We're in talks, and and this is me coming from a humble heart, but we're in talks with a with a family to possibly do one in Italy next year, which would be. Which would be pretty insane. It's on an yeah. island. Yeah, it's on an island in Italy. We'll we'll see. It's like very preliminary, and they're going to interview a ton of ton of different people. But um, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad way to maybe retire after that. Dude, that that is that's a Hall of Fame run. Like yeah. win the Super Bowl and retire. That's pretty. Yeah. Epic. It would be uh, it would be pretty sweet. It's pretty. It's like a twenty four person wedding. It's like real small and intimate. So. I've never been to Europe. I don't know if you have, but it sounds like a good way to maybe extend a trip and spend a little time over there. That, I want to get there. I spent a month in Australia, but I have not actually gotten Ooh. to be in, in Europe yet. Um, I, I wish I did more fishing there, actually. But oh, well, maybe, maybe if I ever get to go again. I'd yeah. rather do Australia than Europe, but that's me. Dude, everything wants to kill you down there. That's the weird part and how chill sure. they are with it. Like, that's what's so weird is how <laughs> chill they are with things will kill you. Like, we want to yeah. go swimming at the beach and like, you can't. Like, why? There's sharks. And it's like, you see these drones and all the flags. Like, yeah, there's like, somebody got taken over there by like a 20 footer. And they're like, so fucking casual about yeah. about yeah. that. Like, over here, that would be news. There'd be SWAT teams yeah. there. No, no problem. Don't go swimming yeah. in there because you might get eaten by a croc. It's like, good Lord. Well, dude, what's crazy too is you look at a satellite image of Australia and how literally no one lives. Like, it's just the coastline and the southeast corner and then it's literally just nothing yeah 
it, it's yeah. it's a it's a wild place. Um, and I definitely want to go back there and actually do some fishing uh, sure. for some of those species there. Uh, and then I, I had a thought was oh yeah so and we don't have to talk about this. This is why I love doing pre recordings. So we can we can edit this out. Aquatic vegetation, Smith Mountain Lake. Being I a live. Minnesota boy, if you could I have live. aquatic vegetation in there, would it make a difference? Hell yeah. Yeah, if there was grass in here, dude. Yeah. I mean, we talk about all the time. I fished on Tuesday with a buddy and um I don't know what it's called, but they have it at they have it at Kerr a lot. We call it like water asparagus. It's like really thin shoots, but it's only in like five spots on the whole lake that are maybe like the size of the deck of the boat. And if the water's low, it's out of the water. If it's up, it's like two inches in. And I, the only time I've ever been able to utilize it for bites is like if when it's the brim spawn or the bluegill spawn and you can go throw a frog on like seven patches of grass and catch a bass. Um, but I do know from satellite images and from my fishing partner, Will, that there was lily pads in here in one stretch back in an area called Penhook that was like a quarter mile long. And you can go back, I think it's 1997 on Google, on the Google or the image stuff, but it was choked full of lily pads. Um, yeah, if there, if there was grass in here, it would separate the bass from the striper. Um, and it would be beyond phenomenal here. I mean, it would just, it would just make this place be, be crazy special, but I don't think it will ever happen ever. Is that because of just the homeowners association yeah. and then pesticiding and all that stuff? Yeah. My understanding is they, that they spray, I've never seen the sprayers, but everyone has told me that they spray for the grass. Um, and dude, it's, it's for, for as busy as this lake gets, it's not as busy as other lakes that I've been on, like Norman or, you know, stuff in Raleigh or anything like that. But J July, August, this place is pretty slammed full of, of pleasure boaters um, all hours of the night, all, all day long. So I don't know when they ganged up on it, but you, you'd think in some of these back pockets, um, they'd be able to throw something in like a little bit of hydrilla or, or some something on the bank that that could spread out or even even just lily pads because i mean lily pads aren't gonna sprout out once they're too deep they just yeah. they won't get the sunlight they need to pop up so there's plenty of back bays that i think could um could get lily pads which would stay and wouldn't affect the pleasure boaters um but i don't know that they would i don't know that they would ever do that but if you can get the dnr on and we can convince them and give them some money then let's do it yeah, um, that's on my to-do list is is getting the DNR down there to talk about Smith. Uh, we had uh, John Halliker on the show who runs the the Valley, uh, I think, to Smith Mountain Lake. And then we had um, Odenkirk on. He talked about how Lake Anna, he tries to keep it in like like 5%, 10% aquatic vegetation. And, and he was perfectly honest. He said, like, you know, you have a lot of pressure from different groups on the lake about not having, you know, it there. And the other thing was like, he said before he got there, they made a mistake with grass carp and they put way too much of them in there. Um, yeah. did, did they have a grass carp issue at Smith ever? I have caught one grass carp on a guide trip. It was a giant dude. It was like 35 inches. It was wow. enormous. Um, but we just have whatever the regular carp are. I don't, I don't know carp species that well, but like the ones yeah. that are at the, the ones that are at the marinas and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I don't know, dude. The the lily pad thing I think would be would be managed easily here to make it where nobody would be upset. It wouldn't there wouldn't be a ton of different areas you could put it in. But I, I always wondered why homeowners care about grass in the lake. I mean, I get it like swimming, jumping off the dock, they want to be jumping into hydrilla and stuff like that, but I mean Smith's pretty highland reservoir. It's got some banks that would have a hard time keeping the grass anyways. Um, so in Minnesota and, and maybe you could talk about this. Is there a different mindset to the outdoors than down here? Now that of you course. moved, like, what, what is the big difference? Because that's the thing when I started this channel and I had somebody in the comment section is like, Oh, I didn't know like aquatic vegetation was good. We used to like dump poison off our docks all the time growing up to get rid of it. It's like, it's such a different mindset. Sure. Um, I think it's more conservation based by miles like i can vividly remember one of my first memories at high rock was me dumping the boat in walking to the dock and there was a guy fishing on a bucket with a five gallon pail next to him and i figured he was keeping panfish and i walked by and there was like two six pound bass in there 
for him to take home and eat. And like a bunch of bluegill laid on top, like no cold, like no number of fish he should keep or anything like that. The dude was just harvesting, which there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I launched the boat being like, don't keep a bass in Minnesota. Like if you catch a bass and you gut hook it, maybe you take it back and eat it or you throw it on the bank for an eagle to get or something like that. But you kept walleyes. If you wanted to pickle a northern every once in a while, crappie and some bigger bluegills when the when the big bull bluegill were up. But you never really kept largemouth. Like all one thing that I definitely think is interesting about just the DNR and, and outdoors in Minnesota in general was, and, and it's one of my big kind of gripes with with Smith Mountain is I think it's weird that there's no like bike path and like infrastructure to enjoy the lake minus the boat ramps and there's a little bridge you know at the bridge at the you know restaurants and stuff like that but dude in Minnesota your fishing license dollars tax dollars re boat registration all of that money gets dumped back into where every lake has like bike paths around it and to a nice boat ramp and nice bathrooms and you know, the boat ramps are managed by, you know, DOT at the same time, like wintertime boat ramps will get cleared. Like, it's just a whole different, probably financial, like budget and mindset up north of, of conservation where, you know, the South dude, it's just like, oh, I'm just going fishing. I'm just going to keep whatever I catch. And there's plenty of fish down here, you know, to make it happen. So on the vegetation side too, I mean, yeah, no, no. Well, I shouldn't say no. There's definitely some lakes in Minnesota that get sprayed because um, there is bad situations where the grass can just obviously take over. Um, but it's a it's a different balance. It's a balance of like, OK, we're going to spray one year, not the next year. See how it comes back. Like there's never a lake in Minnesota that I can remember where it's like we killed everything in here because we can't take it. Mm -hmm. um, I think they just kind of think that the ecosystem needs needs that. So. It is, it is crazy. I think this is where we have to do a better job, um, at, at changing the culture because that's how you preserve some of these fisheries, especially, um, you know, I, I've had the privilege to talk to like the Maryland DNR and they're like, we're a small state. And ever since COVID, there are more people in the outdoors. There are more people enjoying these lakes and yep. we're not doing major lake building anymore. And so we need to do a better job of husbanding these resources and educating the public, about yep. all these issues. And these are some issues that I didn't know about. Like I knew about the aquatic vegetation I, until I started talking to the people that run like Deep Creek Lake. I didn't know how, how the wake boats are becoming more and more of an issue. Sure. And after talking to them about how there's a massive erosion and there's becoming issues with how many that and the lakes are getting that disrupted by the waves. And I don't know, yep. can you talk about, is that an issue at Smith too? Yep. They just uh, came out last year. There's some new um, uh, permits, the wrong word. I'm just going to call it permit, but yeah. basically uh, they came out with something new for Smith mountain that if you have a small pocket here with no, and you do not have no wake buoys and you want your pocket to be no wake buoys. Basically, I think it's like 80% of the residents have to sign on to the agreement. Um, and it has, you have to have show insurance damage for erosion or damage to your docks and stuff like that. And if they can pool enough of this information together, they will make it a no wake cove. Um, but dude, I mean, it's one, it's, it's erosion, obviously, like I can just see it from being here just a couple of years of banks that I just know are like in S like in turns where I know the wakes are just bashing into it literally for 15 hours a day in August. Like it's just okay. getting completely wiped away. And we have rip wrap repair, um, that run out of two different ramps on this lake and they run Monday through Friday. Like I'm out early in the morning, they're dumping a whole truckload of rip wrap onto a barge and they're going up the lake, um, and, and redumping somewhere. So, for me, it has always been the wakeboard stuff has always been a safety thing because Smith Mountain is big, but once you get out from the lower end, it's two rivers. And if you don't have a place to wakeboard and you're going to wakeboard in the middle of the channel at two o'clock on a Saturday in August and you fall off your wakeboard or your wake skate or whatever, I mean, there's both left and right everywhere that are driving right past you. Um, and no offense to just the general public, but there are idiots that think they can drive boats that have no idea how to drive a boat. Like don't know that they don't slow down very fast. That water's like, have no friction. Like you're going to mm -hmm. keep going. Um, 
so for me, it's like, it, it has been that. And then dude, from a bass boat perspective, I mean, not that it's unfair to us or anything like that, but dude, if you're in an 18 foot boat in August and in and, and Smith, you're, you're hurting your back. You're busting yeah. screws out of your boat. Like I'm in a bigger Ranger now. Uh, and I bought an older one with bigger gunnels because I was sick of water coming over the front when I'm trying to fish a point or something like that. Like I'm sick of my feet getting soaked and, and stuff like that. But you know, I don't know where the balance is with that because there's, I don't think there's a way for them to regulate how many wakeboard boats there are or anything like that. I just think it's, it's kind of part of it, but Smith mountain definitely, I've had a few unsafe encounters with jet skis or, or wakeboard really? boats. We had, we had somebody ago, a jet ski slammed into a, like a chaparral, like this cruiser boat and legit almost cut it in half. Jesus. Yeah, like dude had major injuries and I think again and going back to like the general public's maybe not that smart. I mean dude probably just thought if he came off the gas, like it would stop or slow down or mm-hmm. whatever. And I mean, dude, he just smoked the side of a side of a boat. And I mean, when I saw it, it was during a tournament night on a Thursday. I mean, when I saw the boat, it was legit like almost cut in half. Um so I don't know. I mean that's that's safety stuff and everyone wants to enjoy the lake a certain way i think there could be balance and i do think on the on the fishing side i mean we luck out um we luck out here with once deer season start like right now dude, during the week i'm the only boat at the ramp um Surprising. It's just, yeah it's just it's deer season it's you know now now it's local time most of the restaurants are kind of closed like monday tuesday wednesday so it's uh I, it's still small enough to where or kind of far enough away where there's not uh, too many pleasure boaters and stuff like that, but dude, I would love I would love for there to be a conversation about vegetation back in here. I I don't know that you know submergent like hydrilla or, or eelgrass or something like that would necessarily be the best idea, but I do think you know I could point on a map to a DNR guy. Here's 15 back bays that are two to four feet. That once you hit the dip, they dump to seven, and the lily pads wouldn't even make it. Um, I think that's a really good idea because like the, the aquatic vegetation is so important for the environment just to, just to create that biodiversity. And, sure. and like you said, like if, if you look at like a Lake Hartwell, a Kiwi, um, Norman a little bit where, where bass, if they don't have that aquatic vegetation and example is we'll just go back to the blueback, they become pelagic. Um, yep. and, and a textbook thing, we have a lake up near us like Frederick and Front Royal where I mean, literally you could you could write a textbook on this. It had a ton of aquatic vegetation in it and it was fantastic for the bluegill and for the largemouth. And then literally they put too much grass carp in there. There's no vegetation. And then blueback were introduced and you can't catch them because yeah. in a generation they learned to just follow that bait and it, yeah. it does affect it. And I think you're right that if you want to catch a dirty 30, it's also a lot easier when you have fish that, they act a little bit differently. Um, let's just put it like that. And they're not like these California, you know, trout eaters that are just, yep. you know, 30 feet gin clear water. Yep. Yeah. I think, um, the blueback stuff's pretty freaky for me from, from a guiding perspective, you know, obviously, like I mentioned the waypoints, there's, there's a ton of structure in Smith Mountain. There's a gazillion brush piles. There's gazillion rock piles, stumps, all that sort of stuff is, Grass would at least give the fish a little bit more of a diversity of protection where if there's just a giant lily pad flat, like who knows where, you know, who knows where your, um, your bass are laying directly in those pads where right now it's like, here's a rock pile. It's as big as the deck of the boat, make seven casts to it, move on. Um, but the blueback stuff from guiding, I'm the same with you, dude. I would stop guiding if it was something where I was having to chase bluebacks over 60 feet and try to have a person who's oh barely used a fishing pole try to toss a fluke 50 feet. Um, yeah. it, it would be, it would make it really, really hard to, uh, really, really hard to guide. And I think there's some bluebacks in here. I don't think it's a huge population. I know I've talked to a bunch of striper guides. They say they're in here. And a lot of the like really, really big bass that I see are mostly from striper guides. You know, they're throwing a, a gizzard chad down in 60 feet and they take a six and a half pound small or like something stupid is you're never going to catch those as a tournament angler anyways. 
Mm-mm. There's no, not there's nothing you can do to go on a main river channel down by the dam and pick through fifty stripers to get the seven eight pound large mouth. It's not going to happen. Like, what is the 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 forage species? Because I've heard I've heard the rumors. Like, um, I know Lake Anna has a a healthy population of blueback herring in it. Definitely down by I think it's like Dyke Three. Definitely okay. a healthy population. Uh, Lake Gaston has them in it. Yes. And I know they also have somebody introduced like spotted bass and that's completely flipped it. That's like Lake Hartwell of the North. It's like insane. A yeah. cur is trying to get them in there. And then you said Smith may or may not. It's like there are in there maybe, but just not a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't ever really try to go see if it's a blueback deal. Like I'm not going to go on some long point and graph out there. Just again, going back to the guiding thing, dude, yeah. I can't have guide clients. <laughs> like I can't have mm-hmm. them grow up throw something that far, like, unless they're eating a two eight on a super heavy head, I'm not going to have a guide client try to do that anyways. I, I had one experience last year that was definitely like blue back. I was flying down the black water and a bunch of fish started blowing up at me right at sunset. And I was like, Oh, it's a bunch of stripers. And I was legit in the middle of the channel in the black water above Christmas tree Island, like deep vertical river channel. And I flew right through the school and it was freaking smallies and they were giant. And there was like a hundred of them. I wow. literally turned the boat around. They were still blowing up for me to be able to turn the boat around, jumped up on the trolling motor, looked at live scope, literally looked like there was 150 fish down there eating bait at the surface over a hundred feet through a bunch of top waters and stuff like that. And it was all super dark brown, huge smallmouth. That's um, stupid. but then what's weird is going back into like how lakes change and, and things change, dude. I never stopped catching smallmouth this year. I was catching more smallmouth in August than I was in March the last few years. So I don't know what happened with them going out and kind of, I would figure smallmouth being vision more, a little more vision based or whatever. They're going to be the ones that are going to chase the blue box, um a lot more than, than what a large mouth might do. But this year I never really had much like crazy, super far out surface activity or anything like that. So that's, that's where I feel like maybe the blue back population's not as, um not as huge as some of some of the other lakes but i mean here it's it's pretty straightforward we have a ton of thread pin we have some monster gizzard shad which is why the swim bait plays here um you know that come up in the spring we have a massive crawdad population um and when i say we have a range i'm talking ned rig size or smaller and i grabbed some out of the rocks that are like the size of my hand like baby lobster crawdads like monster crawdads um which I think that's why we have a good jig bite also. That's what I was um, going to say. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we have, a, we have a really good jig bite. And then we have a pretty substantial population of bluegills, man. I mean, the bluegill, um, the bluegill spawn, like, water, back of pockets, swim jig type deal. I mean, you can do that through August here, and it's pretty obvious. It's You don't have to check too many back pockets to see, you know, a section that's got 30 brim beds on it, and they stay there through most of the summer. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward from, a if you know, bait movement in the textbook of, of bass movement, if you just take some time before you start fishing, you should be able to kind of find, find bait and find fish. And then the population just of shad in general is just stupid. Right. It, when you, when you drive your graph and it's 80 feet deep of, of shad for a half mile in a little section you're just like this is so stupid that's that's insane but i mean again like smith mountain lake is is insanely fertile and and and, sure. and we've been talking about the blueback guys and that's just something that like i had a lot of experience fishing for that those lakes in college and you're seeing blueback being introduced by striper fishermen but it, it's more of like it's what it does to their behavior and this good this is a good tie into what you were talking about how much how many if you had to say a percentage wise what percentage of the population of bass are just pelagic like on smith that you said like 60 feet and, and whatever like are are they really just roaming there is there a good population to just roam with the stripers or it, it, how, how is it broken out i offshore fishermen but i still have not cracked the code out here to be completely could be completely honest of like 35 feet and deeper I just never have had to to catch a four to five six pound fish and to fish deeper than 35 feet um as well when i graphed i didn't really find much stuff in that range where it was like something for them to hold on to and it's hard for me to go fish a roaming school mm-hmm. over over nothing 
even with front facing technology. I mean, dude, fish fast and the technology is great, but if you lose them and all of a sudden you find them, they're 100 feet out, your trolling motor can't keep up with them, then it's like, well, what are we doing here in the tournament trying to trying yeah. to fish for that? So I, I would say the majority of the bass are 30 feet or shallower at Smith Mountain, no matter what weather conditions, water conditions. And I think a lot of people, um, and, and maybe this is why Smith's not super popular saying like the fall and the winter and stuff like that besides this local guys, but dude, we have a good shallow water bite almost all year. Really? Um, yeah, there's there's big fish. Until the water hits 50 degrees, I have no problem going and fishing in two feet of water, um, wow. which is surprising to a lot, even in, even in that cold. But, dude, some of the baits still get pushed back way, way shallow, and, and that might be a little bit when the stripers and the bass kind of mix together. Is that, excuse me, is that kind of like yeah, stun late period? um or kind of like january february time frame is is something where when the water stabilized and it's all the same temperature i mean i've definitely seen huge schools of stripers push bait all the way back into massive creek arms and just chop on them for three days until they're gone um and that's just me spending time on the water but as far as roaming fish and and, and big ones of that size like i mentioned the striper guys show me pictures at the gas station all the time of like hey look at this bass i caught him it's like a it's like a seven to nine pounder and they're just kind of nonchalant about it. Like, yeah, I just caught it over here, but we were in 65 feet and we were smashing the stripers. And it's like for, for however often that happens with them, I just don't fish like that. And uh, I don't have to fish that deep to, to catch those caliber fish. But you say you do a lot of graphing. Like what is your graphing setup and what honestly got you into that going from Minnesota to the Carolinas to here and then being sure. almost like a TVA guy? Like sitting yeah, behind yeah, yeah. there like the whole time. Yeah. So going back to how I kind of honestly wanted my life to be set up back in the wedding stuff was to me, a successful angler is not necessarily a guy that just picks up a rod and go fishes by instinct. At least now to stay competitive, you have to use your electronics. You have to spend the time to graph. Yes, you can get lucky and catch a big one every once in a while or win every once in a while, but you're definitely hindering yourself if you don't force yourself to to graph so i run garmin's i bought live scope as soon as it came out because as a young guy i mean i was into video games i was into mm -hmm. watching screens and all that sort of stuff i mean i saw whatever the uh, initial promotion was and i think it was like hartwell or smith lake or something like that and the guy went up to a point and said oh we would normally throw a top water right at the point and he throws it twice and doesn't catch anything and then he shows pan optics and he looks left and right and the fish are not on the point the fish are like 50 feet to the right of the point over nothing and he throws the top water over there and catches them yeah. and i literally I've, I've been friends with will the whole time i've lived in the south i called him the day i bought it and i was like dude yeah, fish are not where we think they are probably the majority of the time Mm -hmm. And the first couple of years where I had live scope, I, I tell this to every client that I take out that wants to learn live scope or anybody that's new to front facing technology. It's not about if you're going to see the fish or not, you're going to find way more fish than you could possibly imagine. It's you have to build up the callus to know that you, those fish are not active and they're not going to bite and don't sit on them for 45 minutes, throwing Thank 25 you. different yeah. baits literally in tournament season, I, I honestly want to get a sticker made and I may do it this year, but me and my fishing partner say Brian thrift. We just say Brian thrift throughout the day, just randomly at random times. Um, because he's just, he's the man when it comes to just covering water and just running. Mm -hmm. And he was doing that before live scope, dude. He would literally just make the decision of, yeah, I know there's fish here. I can see him on my 2d. I can see him on side scan. I'm leaving. Like once you build that with front facing sonar of, Hey, We've thrown three baits at this brush pile. They're following the baits. We've switched the worm color twice. They're not biting. So we're gone. We spend eight minutes on a pile and we say Brian's rip to each other. And, move. and that's really, really good at Smith because I kind of consider Smith of more of like a spot lake. It's pattern of bull, but it's not as pattern of bull as say Kerr. Um, but the technology side, so, so that's kind of the front facing side is one, you're taking your guessing of throwing into a brush pile or throwing at a round pile and you're making it where you're casting in there on the first try. So you're already saving a massive amount of time just on that alone. But then you're also what would have taken 15 minutes of you throwing a jerk bait, say in December, can realize that they're not eating a jerk bait today and you pick up a 2.8 and they're deciding they want to eat a swim bait instead. And you can figure that out in 15 minutes as opposed to half of the day. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the other part. But on 
everything in general. I run 12 inch 126 UHDs from Garmin and side scan. I put it 70 feet. Um, you know, I probably should do a video on this, but I'm a big believer of just rules of three. So three baits in a brush pile move or like three different top waters. And so what I graph, what I do is if I have a point, um, how I did Smith and this is how I do most of my tournaments like regionally is I'm doing three passes. So I'm going kind of medium left to right on a point, I'm going shallow left to right, and then I'm coming right back from deep to shallow um, and readjusting my waypoints based on that. And I've basically done that twice on all of Smith Mountain is every point I've gone over three times or well, six times at this point and readjusted the waypoint and kind of figured out um, figured out what is there. And then the only other real like phrase that I use specifically, and this is in me in tournament mode, not necessarily in guiding mode, but I'm looking for the juice that's inside the juice. So with live scope, for example, on Smith, we have tons of rock piles. Well, that's great, but I want the biggest rock in the rock pile. And so being able to see on side scan that, hey, we got a rock pile, it's 20 feet long, or it's a long sheet of rock pile, but there's a giant boulder on the left side that's bigger than any rock that's in that um, streak of rock. And then that's where I utilize live scope until I line up and I can see where there's this, you know, a higher rise on my return. Um, and that's where I'm trying to hit it with a crankbait or hit it with a jig or something like that. Do you um, still think the three pass method is, is the pro, is, is the best way to do it with live scope where you can look there immediately to then first know, like, is there a fish that's actually active here? And then I can readjust my angle and plan of attack. Well, rephrase that. So you're saying skipping graphing side scan and just grab your front facing and go instead of instead of hitting it. So let's say you're in a tournament instead of hitting it during the tournament from three different angles. Got it. Um, would you just cut that down since you do have forward facing sonar now to know like, hey, OK, they're not active here, period. Yes. Just leave. Yeah. Yeah. I'm strictly talking about practice and practice, uh, okay. and, practice and, and prepping for guide trips and stuff like that. I don't I don't side scan during a tournament or anything like that. Pretty much. Pretty much, liter like, dude. I don't even have a two D sonar uh, buck on my train on my yeah, train motor anymore. <laughs> yeah, dude, I got rid of it probably three years ago. And I would tell anyone who thinks they need it that you don't even need it in the winter when you wanted to meet gear or anything like that because you can do down on um, on live scope. And it's just, dude, I don't. Whatever's next, I have no idea what the hell they're going to come out with next, dude. Like people are asking me, I'm on the old live scope transducer, and people are like, you getting a new one? And I'm like maybe when my one fries like mm -hmm. I, I already have mine to where i feel like it's dialed beyond belief that i don't need to see anything else um i know what a fish is i mean once you spend enough time with front facing whether it's any of the companies i mean dude you you, you can literally tell what's a bass and what's not the only thing i can say that's pretty close to a bass is maybe like a wolf pack of carp um they kind of swim at the same speed but dude if you dropped a if you sent me a live scope image on the front i could probably tell you what kind of fish it is i mean you can even tell the difference between largemouth and smallmouth dude if you throw a jerk bait on on a point and there's four bass together and you start jerking it largemouth are going to kind of all four come together smallmouth go insane dude they jump to the front of the bait the back up down like you you instantly know what what type of fish is is going to bark. That's, so. that's the thing about live scope what people don't understand is like it's, it's not just about seeing the fish it's the fish behavior and it makes good anglers Way great than because you understand so much more of what's oh, yeah. going on down there. Dude, you can you can have 20 rods on the deck, and by the end of a tournament, I would be down to three because I just know that that's the only thing that they're going to bite today. And it makes you make adjustments way quicker, but I don't know. The, anybody that hates on live scope or, or front facing just makes me laugh because you still cannot make them bite. It does not matter. It does not add to the pressure of, you know, are they seeing more baits? Of course. They're definitely seeing more baits. Is that going to make a huge difference in the long run? Maybe, but we're going to, as anglers, dude, we're going to ebb and flow the whole way. If the offshore fish get pressured to live scope, then go fish shallow. The shallow fish haven't been hit for five years. Keith Poche, look yeah, what he dude. just did. I, yeah, I, mean, I mean, you're right. Yeah, um, if, if the offshore fish aren't acting right, go go shallow. And if, yeah, there's just been, there's been so many anglers that have, that have moved to offshore like I, I, I should rephrase that a little bit. I mean, I do take it back this year. The drop shot was just not super great for me for guiding for some reason. And I think a lot of that might be that all of us live scope guys are dropping it right in their face as opposed to five, six, eight years ago, it was being dragged past them. 
Um, and so we kind of know when that thing falls right in their face that maybe that's not the best choice. But again, two years from now, when everyone's not throwing a drop shot and goes to a shaky head, and then you pick up a drop shot one day just out of curiosity, and then you smoke them for a year. So, I mean, I have to ask everyone this question um, when it comes to the live scope thing to see where, where you stand on it. Where do you think this ends? Like with the whole technology thing in the sport, I mean, do you think it should just continue like this? Should there be any kind of like restrictions at some point? Like where does this end up? Mm, I fight with that a little bit, dude, because I do think fishing is getting a little bit expensive for the, the That's average my thing. guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely do say that. And again, I try to come off as a, as a humble person from this. I did work my ass off to get where I'm at. Yeah. Um, so that allowed me to be in the position to say buy the expensive technology. Um, but your average guy, I mean, dude, I can remember guys leaving tournaments just bitching and being pissed that they were getting their shit kicked in because guys had live scope and they didn't. And they lost for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, they lost money. Even pros. Dude. I mean, some of the pros went up to started going up north without live scope and they were getting stomped on yeah. by no names. Like, dude, Patrick Walters, he seems like a super nice guy. I've never talked to him, but dude, he's he stomped on people. When he oh, the Lake Fork scope. tournament was insane. Dude, yeah, he just oh and he's God. just throwing a jerk bait and he's just stomping faces of like very good anglers. Um, I don't think it's an unfair advantage at that level. I can see it at a at a localer level where, yeah, I mean, you got, for example, the cats. I mean, I'm able to afford the stuff that I'm able to because I guide. If I wasn't guiding, I wouldn't have 12 inch screens and, you know, a 250 horsepower motor. I'd have an 18 foot boat with a 150 and a graph. Um, and I think that that kind of hinders it for, for that level, but that's hard to, that's hard to regulate as far as where it goes or, or what's allowed. Um, I think it's the number of graphs. I think that's the only thing you can do. Cause I mean, again, you can cheaply, and there's been YouTubers and tons of people that done that. You, you can cheaply get the technology. I, I think it's, I think the bigger issue, and this is a marketing guy is the optics. When you have guys with six graphs and like, Dude, it's, so it, stupid. it's, you are becoming, you're becoming the one percenters. Like you spend more on your sport than golf and like equine sports in Europe. Yeah. Like it's insane. Yeah. And then yeah. you tell kids going into college and high school, like this is what you got to do to compete. And I think yeah. that's where they're going to get an image problem here in, in 10 years where it's going to cost $200,000 for a rig to play. Yeah. 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 I think, um, yeah, I think the money side, you know, I've never owned a new boat in my life. Um, this is the first new motor that I bought. I just put a Suzuki on this boat, um, which that stung real bad. Yeah. <laughs> is is I, I would do a new boat if it was some sort of program or guide sponsorship type deal. Of course, I would take advantage of that. I have no problem like selling boats and talking to people about boats. But yeah, I mean, the the possibility of, of where it goes in the form of who can afford to do it is, is definitely a certain, a certain aspect. I mean, you do, you see it in the tournament stuff. They're making dudes do all nine opens. I ran the numbers of like how many days off of work you would need, how many actual days of travel that is. You can't have a regular job. Mm -mm. You, you can't get enough. You, you will get fired. You don't have enough days off um, to do it. So yeah, that, I don't know how long that's been like that, and and I don't want to bash the competitive side of fishing because that's what obviously has the oh, yeah. the sport of people going out and and wanting to hire guys like me and and go fishing and enjoy the outdoors. But there's definitely a there's an interesting balance to that. The like six graphs and stuff, dude. Whew, I for me, it's more of a perspective of like, are you actually like? Me personally, dude, like I have ankle issues. My neck hurts after I go out all day. Like, dude, I'm not even looking up sometimes to like enjoy what I'm actually doing. I'm playing a video game. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely have come home before and been like, you know what? I'm not going to turn live scope on when I go fun fish the next day. I'm just going to leave my graphs off. I'm going to enjoy nature and, you know, the birds and the wind and like what's actually around me. Um, so that's, that's more of like the spiritual side that I see is like, are we actually enjoying the outdoors or are we just buying our way into being slightly more competitive or com can having a competitive advantage over the next guy to you? And then dude, it doesn't, who cares if you have six graphs, if you run to the wrong spot and they're not active, yeah. it doesn't matter anyways. 
No, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's a hundred percent true. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think at some point, just from a marketing standpoint, something will have to be done, but you can't limit technology. That's just how it goes. It's so yeah. integrated into the sport. Like, yeah. and, and you, and I, I've heard this from Travis, uh, Travis Luger, who fished the opens this past year, but he said like, there's a lot of bank that's opened up ever since live scope became a thing in tournament trails. And so it's actually bringing back, like you said, shallow fishing, um, Good fighter, uh, when he won AOI didn't fish deeper than 10 feet, dude. Yeah. John Cox, you know, like, yep. I mean, like Keith Poche, like you can do it and you shouldn't bash live scope. Um, just be, just because, uh, you, you think you can't afford it or it's like this, it's, they said the same thing about side scan too. And side scan came out like it, it is what it is there. And, and you mentioned something I, I wanted to make sure we, we touched on, which is like, you said Smith is a spot lake versus Kerr, which is, which is pattern. And then you got like, you know, the white river lakes. Why is that? Is it, is it something about the behavior of the fish on this specifically that makes it so you can't run patterns? Cause there's so many awesome docks and there's so much cover sure. and structure on this place. Sure. I think this lake's more, um, so this goes back to my F1 concept this year specifically. Last two years were awesome. If it was a windy, shitty, crappy, cloudy day out here, I could go catch a five pounder. Like I could just go hit enough piles and I would catch a five pounder. This year, something flipped where I just literally went back and looked at my notes and I was only catching good tournament quality fish when it was bright and sunny and high pressure. Like typical, like Florida, hot, gross, like, I don't know. And again, I mentioned earlier, like, dude, I was catching smallmouth all year long. Like, they just never disappeared like they did the last two years. Um, so for me, how I kind of break it down here is I pay attention to moon phase a lot. Um, I did pay attention to win a lot, but I'm trying to, like, kind of break that habit out a little bit is the only thing that I can really get on a pattern on is what are they actually eating for, say, this specific week. And it changes pretty more frequently here than it does at other places. But, like... All of a sudden, I'll go out on a Monday for a guide trip and they stop biting this top water. Like, let's say they were biting a walking bait. They don't get any walking bait bites on a Monday, even though nothing's really changed. And I have a guide client pick up a popper and I smash them for some reason. Or you throw a shaky head and smash them, and then all of a sudden I'm not getting any bites. And I have a guide client pick up a jig, and it's like the fish are still right there. I can see them on live scope, but all of a sudden they're biting a jig. And then I go out three days that week and it's just like, for some reason, the jig just turned on and the next Monday you go out and throw a jig and you don't get a bite. So it's a pattern in a form of that structure wise, dude, there's always fish and brush here. Like it doesn't matter what time of year it is. And then, like I said, I catch big ones shallow in December and I catch big ones shallow in August. Like it's all over, it's all over if they're on wood or if they're on rock, like there's fish in my opinion. And maybe that's just because it's a big population of of bass to where it's less patternable, but I haven't been on something where it's like, I need to go hit rock in three feet of water that's on north facing bank that's getting wind blown and I have to throw this color of a jig. We've never had to get that specific here. Um, it's just been kind of like go fishing and see what they're biting because <laughs> they're gonna change they either change from a couple days ago or they're still doing the same thing is basically where I'm at. And again, that's just time on the water for me, um, which is different to most guys. But for example, when I've gone to bugs a bunch, it's like, okay, the water's flooded and you go throw a spinnerbait and you can go throw a spinnerbait anywhere in the lake. It does not matter. And they're going to eat the spinnerbait there in the bushes, like find them on that where Smith, it's like you caught one in a lay down, you go fish lay downs for two hours and you don't get a bite. You go to your first rock pile and catch a five pounder. Um, so that's how I have experienced Smith is you're covering water. You're, you're testing a bunch of different things throughout the day because it's going to change throughout the day. That is really interesting that you thought it, you, you, your hypothesis is it's the F ones that have changed it where they're finicky on bright days, because I would have gone that they're really targeting more like pelagic species of bait because they want those clear conditions to ambush. Like, it, do you think that's a cycle or do you think that's something that's like kind of here to stay? Cause there's more F ones now. What's your vibe? I can't say if it's a cycle yet, just cause I, again, from a data perspective, this is the first year where it's been wonky. The first two years, it was pretty, I'll, I'll just use textbook as a phrase. It was pretty textbook for me to go out and like continue following the fish around and being able to do those slight changes in the bait and stuff like that. 
Um, but yeah, this year I definitely have gone back and looked in the notes and I'm scratching my head in the form of like, why can't I get a six pounder to bite a swim bait on a windblown point in May? Hmm. Like they're there. I can see them. They will follow the bait. And then I go out on the next day with a guide client, no wind. It's 11 o'clock in the afternoon. It's 70 degrees already. And they sling it up there and the six pounder eats it. And it's like, what the hell? Um, and then that just kept happening and, and happening and happening to where it was like, I don't understand why I'm getting these big bites in the middle of the day. You know, and I pay attention to lunar stuff too. Like I look at moonrise and get really nerdy on barometric pressure and like really in the really? weeds on, on some of the fishing stuff. And this year has just been super weird on the data side of, of how the fish have been. And the only thing I can really think is, <clears throat> and this could be completely wrong. This is me just spending time on the water and just, you know, talking is if an F one's got Florida mixed in and Florida bass are finicky with cold weather and changing weather conditions, then that leads me to say that are these F ones becoming the predominant species. And now we're seeing a shift where they don't want to eat on shitty days, which I'm going to be wrong. dude. I mean, people are going to smash when it blows 20 Mm -hmm. miles an hour in october here like i don't have a i don't have a problem saying that but for me specifically this year i just saw something weird that it it happened enough times for me and as as nerdy as i am on this stuff where i definitely noticed something was different and i just correlated that with maybe the f1s didn't like the crappy weather this year for some reason you sound like a musky angler when you start talking about the lunar thing (laughs) that's where i pick hey that's where i picked it up dude (laughs) they're right they are right like when we get on, when the jig bite's good here, dude, it is, it is like clockwork. Like if you look and if we get a 2 a.m. full moon rise and then the lunar rise is 1030 in the morning, me and my fishing partner will look at each other and say, all right, we're setting an alarm on our phone for 10 a.m. And at 10 a.m. we're switching from whatever we're doing. We're going and chucking a jig for two hours. And you just go chuck at rocks and you'll catch a big one. Like it's it's a thing, dude. They know way, fish know way more than we know with what's going on with the universe and what's coming and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, dude, even for the big bass, I had a couple, I had a couple clients and I went fun fished myself when it went from pretty warm to like, okay, the hurricane's coming, like it's going to be here. And you would have thought they would have gagged the day before the big bass. It was blowing 30 miles an hour. Cloud cover was rolling in. I mean, it was stirring up everything, dude. It was probably one of the tougher guide days I've had all year. That's weird. And then the pressure finally showed up from the hurricane. And I mean, yeah, there was a lot of good bass caught during the big bass, but you heard a lot of the guys say, and from me watching, the local guys didn't do super hot for the first day. Um, hmm. They had to make some adjustments and the couple that I, that got interviewed and stuff, I mean, they said they were catching them shallow, which is what I was catching them doing. And they said they had to go out deeper, which they pulled water and everything like that. But yeah, it was like on a day where you would think by textbook definition, prefrontal barometric pressure dropping out its ass that fish should chew and they're set up shallow. They, it was tough, dude. It was super tough. What made you keep notes? Like that is brilliant. And I love that attention to detail. What may, is that something you've always done where you keep a, a log? Yeah. Or yeah. So got a gift i don't even i was still in minnesota when i got it for a birthday or christmas something it was like some leather bound like old man fishing journal deal that had like the lines pre-made for you like wind direction water temperature like lures used all that sort of stuff um what actually annoyed me this year was a guide client put me on that angler app um with the push button because I don't do it every day. I try to intermittently do it. And I share, it's basically a notepad on my phone at this point. Mm. I try to punch in the the water temperature and what the weather is going to be right when I launch the boat in the morning. And then when I get home, I take two minutes before I go to bed and just try to like data dump like areas and what type of structure and wind direction essentially. Um, But the Angler app, I was really pumped about because you can push that bullseye thing and it will literally put everything there. It will like, it would, supposedly was supposed to like put what the weather was wind direction like everything into the system and then all you would have to put in is like the lures you were using so i ordered the button and the battery was dead in it and then looked them up on facebook and everything and they're non-existent now it's Ah. like all these messages on facebook like no one's there to help like 
they're supposed to send you a new one with battery, but the, it was a bad business idea. They didn't do like a monthly subscription. They just did. It's $30 for the button and that's it. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm guessing they just ran out of funding or, or whatever. But um, so if somebody else could create that, please, that would be super helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, the, the notes thing for me was more, it's more tournament based than guiding based. Um, I share it with my partner, Will, on the notepad on an iPhone. You can share it with whoever you want. And then him and I just reference it and, and use that as like a starting point of when we practice for tournaments. Like, hey, this is what was happening last year. Like, let's go try to break this pattern. And if we can break it, then we know we got to figure something else out. Or then we just cut our practice time by 90% because everything's still doing the same thing. Does that hurt though? Having like, you know, yeah. the home field curse on yep. Smith and stuff like, Oh yeah. I, um, <laughs> I literally, dude, that's so funny you ask. Cause I literally have been calling will probably once a day to talk for like 20 minutes about what's going on. So <clears throat> definitely think it's a thing. Um, that mixed with live scope is like a, just a straight, like bad toxic relationship is, <laughs> <laughs> because you're running these spots, you're seeing these fish. I can't get them to bite. I have no idea what size. Well, I kind of have an idea what size they are, but I see them. If I go out and have a bad practice, I'm still going to run back to those same fish because I didn't find anything else anyways, and maybe they'll bite. Um, so like the first year, the first year when I moved here, me and Will did extremely well in the camp. And that's because I feel like I didn't have a ton of spots. I went in and like, when I practiced, I was doing basic stuff. Like I'm just, just going to go look for bait. All I'm going to do is mark pockets that have bait. We'll figure out what lure they're biting on a tournament day. And I would just spend three days just grabbing, looking for bait. Now, when we practice for tournaments, the second year, like a dumbass, I was just like, oh, we don't need to necessarily like find what area of the lake's alive. We can just run 50 rock piles or 50 brush rock piles, whatever. Um, and everyone really struggled last year because the water was super clear. Like the first year here, it was like five, six, eight bags over 20. Last year, it was like one guy caught 22 pounds. Everyone else had like 18. Um, and then it fell off super quick. So, and that I think was just, they pulled the water. So a lot of the good, like shallow rock was out of the water and, um, the fish, the bait actually never went to the backs of pockets last year. Super weird. And now this year. By the last week in September, I had bait in the back of pockets, and I could catch fish on a buzz bait in late September. It got um, cold too. It felt like it, it got cooler this year. So yeah, we're in the 30s for Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday here. I talked to another guy from the Cat Trail, one of the guys that runs it, and I told him, I said, "Dude, we have a large gap in times this this year for tournaments. We have one October 30th, and the next one's not till the end of November." I told him, "Dude, if it goes at this pace, those fish will be way offshore by end November." Yeah. Um, so, which, you know, that's, that's just totally different than the last couple of years, but, um, yeah, the whole, the home curse is interesting because you're going, you're going by your gut of, oh, I've caught four or five pounders off this fresh pile. You go there, you see four bass on top of it in practice. They don't bite. You check it two times. They don't bite. You don't find anything in practice. You go right back to that brush pile when really, mm-hmm. When really what I should be doing is saying, all right, those fish are inactive. I'll spend two minutes on them. I'm not going to go back to them if they don't bite for the whole day. Um, so you can definitely, I mean, that's, that's why fishing is fun in my opinion is it's so much more mental than any sport in my opinion, um, because you're trying to catch something else that has a brain. So, you know, you're, you're taking into factor their brain but you also major have to take into factor your brain. Um, and so that's goes back to that whole Brian thrift concept of, you know, yeah. will kind of holds me accountable as a, as a good fishing bro of, you know, he'll put me in my place on a tournament day. If I'm taking too long on a pile or we're staying in the same area. Um, you know, th- this lake is definitely interesting too, from it being two river systems that in my opinion are pretty different um from structure and you know the stripers run way up the roanoke they don't really run up the black water as much um and so this lake too can set up in the form of if you don't get a bite for two hours you should move sections like if you're on the lower end and you don't get a bite for two hours run past the bridge 
there's always a bass somewhere on this lake that's eating. And that goes back to that home advantage of um, having the spots. If you are only catching fish in the lower end in practice, let's say as a collegiate angler, and you fish Craddock for practice, and it's awesome for two days, and then you go in the tournament, and you have one bite by 11, you have to have the confidence here to say, all right, I know there's bass in Gills Creek, or I know there's bass up by by magnums or i'm going to run up to beaver dam like i'm going to get away from where i'm at because there's different structure different water temperature different bait and and there's always fish eating on this lake so is this going to be because and, and i think we talked about this before we started recording that you, you want to take a crack a swing at either the opens or whatever the hell mlf is calling their new thing yeah. now that's yeah. the invitational like if that's your plan like I would say your strategy is like basically thrift. You're going to thrift it then yeah. you know, on any place that you go, yep. right? Yeah. So I don't know that I would ever go full steam ahead on tournament fishing. It's uh, from mm -hmm. a from a financial perspective, I've been in business too long, bro, to know that it's a pay to play system and it's pretty yeah. tough to make some killer money on it. I love the sport. I would absolutely love to do it. I have mad respect for people that make it happen because I think I work hard they have sacrificed so much they have stressed oh, yeah. more than anybody i have ever known in life um for me i i would consider a a, a run at like regional stuff like like i did the abas and fished the aba national because it were, was it bugs would i ever fish all nine opens probably not would i jump in a full division probably um but i wouldn't do that until everything in my life was completely paid off <laughs> or I only had a mortgage or, or something like that. Like I'm not yeah. gonna, I'm not gonna risk my uh, hard earned dollar for something where if I got to be 200 guys, I got to get fourth place to actually dent, um, dent the money that I made. So, I don't know what you can do to fix it because yeah, it's, if you have any, if you look at it from a financial standpoint, it makes no sense. It's yeah. one of the only sports where they hand you a bill, not a contract. Yeah, no, man. It's, it's sad too. And I don't, I don't want to be this guy that like bashes on it. Cause again, it's the sport that allows me to guide and gets people into it. And there is a, I mean, there's a serious, like, I don't know. It's, it's like the hunter inside all of us guys and not throwing the ladies out, but obviously most of the anglers are guys, but like it's, it's the hunt, dude. It's the chasing something mm -hmm. down tricking an animal it's catching the biggest thing i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of mental side to it so <clears throat> you know for me jumping in at kerr i just i had never fished an open as a as a pro i fished as a co and i did pretty well i had i think out of the five or six opens that i fished i had three or four top tens um so i understand that concept of, of tournament fishing but that is exactly how i fish tournaments what i do when I do cats here, when I do cats at Kerr, I fish the James. Um, um, when I fish, I fish the two day at Norman to qualify for that ADA national. Same thing. I'm trusting the technology. I'm trusting that if the fish are active, they're going to eat. If they're not, I'm not going to sit there and force feed them. Um, even on really crappy conditions, you can still go find um, go find active fish. I think I'm a decent all around fisherman just from how long I've been fishing and then moving from grass glacial lakes in Minnesota to, you know, fishing the Yadkin chain, dirty, you know, dirty kind of island reservoir water to now being at Smith where I can kind of do both. Um, I still need to kind of work on some title stuff, but dude, I mean, I have a spinning rod in my hand, probably eight out of 10 tournaments. Like I'm really, yeah, I'm, I keep it pretty finessey. I keep it, I keep it pretty, um, you know, I think a big one will eat a four inch worm just as easy as it will eat a mop jig. Um, so that's how I didn't nail you down as a, as a, as a, a spinning rod guy, oh, dude, just like yeah. with how our conversation has gone on. I never would have guessed that. I mean, dude, don't get me wrong. I will catch them on a 10 inch mag draft all day long, but I know if I yeah. don't get a bite in five hours, I can go pick up a Demiki rig and go catch four pounders. Mm -hmm. They're just no, I, not I, as fun. I, I, I'm in that camp too. I grew up doing a lot of saltwater fishing and you can, I, I, I power finesse probably 80% of the time, but you can, you can, if you can catch a tuna on a spinning outfit, you can catch a six pound bass. Yep. Like, and there are some tricks that I, that I have at least picked up with spinning tackle that for some reason, 90% of the bass population, the people don't understand that you don't have to use a bait caster in yep. a lot of situations. Spinning tackle is actually better. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, 
it's a pride. I think it's just a pride thing, dude. I don't, I don't yeah. really, I mean, dude, you know how much easier it is to skip a three thirty second shake. He had way under a dock than it is a half ounce jig. Mm-hmm. And guess what? If a six pounder is under there and it can't see seven pound line and it's got a four inch worm on the end of it, as opposed to your 18 or 20 pound fluorocarbon and a jig, the size of your fist, like, I just think they'll eat that a little bit more often. It's more natural I, looking and it's more, it's, it's more, I, I don't, I don't know. I catch I, guiding does it too, dude. I mean, nobody, I, I rarely have people throw bait sure. casters. And so I see all year long that I can have somebody who barely knows how to fish, throw a drop shot into a rock pile and catch a four pounder. So then why, mm-hmm. if I can use the technology to perfection and toss a, you know, a toss a drop shot or a Ned rig or something literally into a fish's face in 25 feet, then I don't, I don't really see the need to say that, Oh, I needed to throw a Carolina rig or I needed to throw a bait caster, some sort of weird, unique thing. I will say on the side of spinning, I do like trying weird Japanese stuff. Like I free rigged, yeah. I free rigged a bunch last year. I'm still like tweaking that a little bit, but free rigging, like weird rigging of worms, um, different weight sizes. I throw a Nico rig a lot. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, that's Minnesota, bro. You threw a spinning rod, like you don't really need to throw anything else. (laughs) It's so crazy. You talked about that with Japanese anglers. When I, um, when I talked to the local high school club here, I said, like, if you had to to put your time and effort into into studying anglers, you study every Japanese guy that comes over here and fishes the elite series because their mindset is so different than sure. ours and they will always catch them. Yep. Um, and I, I forget who it was that explained like who I listened to, but it's like, because they have so few lakes over there, they don't, they don't drive around the whole lake. They looking for like the, the perfect group. They just sit in an area and figure it out. And yep. when they come over here, that's why they can kick ass in so many local honey holes because they're just used to like, there's fish here. I will figure it out. Sure. And that's where I'm putting my time in practice. And it's such yep. a unique mindset that over here, we don't have it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely part of the struggle with, with me being like a Brian thrift fan and stuff is like, <laughs> yeah, I probably could sit on a brush pile for 45 minutes and throw a two inch lifeless stick bait, you know, on four pound line. Um, what you say, your soul's going out of your body. Yeah, but yeah, but then you're sitting there <laughs> and you're just questioning your entire life existence and why did you wake up and it's freezing and like this is pointless. I could be in my bed with my wife. Um, so, but but I definitely do like, um, I, I like tinkering a, a decent amount, um, which is kind of off the wall. Whether it's colors or sizes, like I I throw Sunline, dude. Sunline seven pound sniper is the best honestly the best line that i have ever used Mm -hmm. i mean i rarely break off and to be able to have that thin of a line diameter at at seven pound is 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 just insane i mean i i have full confidence i throw it in brush piles i don't have issues um really anywhere around here and i mean dude it's it's honestly it's almost invisible so preach i love sunline product yeah little little things like that and um it this is the number one thing with fishing. The more time on the water you spend, the better I will catch more on spinning rods. Just in general, it does not matter what the, even the weather conditions are. I will catch more fish on a spinning rod. Preach it. A- Amen, sir. Um, and Billy, I mean, we covered a whole, whole, just ton of subjects. Yeah. Have, uh, fun, cutting, have, have, fun, have fun cutting this down. <laughs> My, the best episodes on this channel are usually the longer ones. We had one with Sikorsky I had to cut down because it was four hours. I had to cut that nice. one down a little bit, but uh, nice. no, you know, pe- people love just, just the long form stuff. Is, is there anything that, that you would like to plug any sponsors, anything like that, that we forgot to mention? Um, I throw Dobbins rods exclusively, um, which I never really had a rod sponsor or anything like that. I mean, I have been using them for years and years now. Gary's a super good guy. Their customer service is rad. Like you can call them Bryce at the, the shop picks up. Like it's uh they're, they're a really good company. They just came out with some new cork design stuff. So if anybody tinkering with rods, they have a good selection of like different series. Um, check them out. 
if anybody has questions about Garmin, they can reach out to me. I'm not associated with them uh, at, at this point yet or at all, but I get a lot of questions about LiveScope, purchasing it, wiring it, all that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm happy to help with that. I do Garmin training classes if, if people want to come out and actually learn the electronic side, um, um, which is good. But other than that, if, if people have never been to Smith Mountain, just look at look at my social stuff, build that back up, look at the website, Google reviews, all that sort of stuff. If it's something where you go to Deep Creek or you go to Anna and you've never made it down this far or you're from PA and you just want to make that drive, then I would say put this on the put this on the travel list, dude, because it's it's pretty unique lake. It's a pretty special place. And guys, like play it now. Remember, episode description, everything is always listed here. So if you would like to go with a guiding trip or anything that he just uh, was talking about, it will be in the episode description. It is Smith Mountain Lake Fishing. Um, that will be in the link down below as well. Billy, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to definitely have you on here a couple more times. I think we're going to talk about, about that when this uh, stream ends here. But guys, please like and subscribe to him on his Instagram and his social media. And then please give us a like. It really helps us in the algorithm so we can keep growing because we are still the fastest growing outdoor fishing show in the greater D.C. metropolitan area. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by... Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.